Hey there, and welcome to that independent streak. I'm your host, Wendy Campbell, and you, my friend, are in the right place. If you are at that point in your life where you have, you know, maybe lived a career or two, perhaps you've had a couple kids, perhaps you've done both, and now you're trying to figure out who you are after all of those things happen. And I know a lot of people are doing it, so you can go ahead and admit to yourself that you're doing it too. Now, maybe you're looking to grow in your work, or maybe you're looking to expand your map with new perspectives. Right here is where we want to offer all of that. And today's conversation is no exception. In fact, an amazing human being. We step in. She's a life coach. She's a corporate coach. She helps train teams and helps you bring yourself back into balance. If you've ever said to yourself, I might be a workaholic, perhaps someone else has said to you, you might be a workaholic, but you laughed and said, no, that's not possible. I've got it under control. You might also be a workaholic. From her book, Unsuccessfully Successful Lessons from a Workaholic Corporate Exec Single Mother's Journey to a Life of Balance. You know you want it too. I mean, this is where it all gets going. We have an amazing conversation with Donna Starr. She's a, an amazing human being, and I'm very excited that she decided to join us today. Our conversation covers the gamut of all the things, but what I love about it the most is that it's so honest. It's, it's that conversation that you have that sometimes you just don't want to share with the world, but you still do. If you enjoy this conversation as much as I did, I invite you to please find us on the social medias. We'll get them posted on all of the show notes, but uh, all the show links will be there as well as uh, the website if you want to find us there, uh, thatindependentstreakpodcast.com. And of course, if you're joining us on YouTube, we invite you to like, subscribe, and share there as well. It only helps more people find the show. So uh, without any further yabbering on on my part, let's bring her in, Donna Starr. Hello, how are you? Oh God, I love your backdrop so much. Thank you, thank you. This is my personal secret and I'll share it with you and only you and anyone else who's listening. I got this because I found that I was wasting too much time waiting for the right moment to clean the room behind me so that I could record a podcast or record the intro. And I found that if I just threw this up, it was almost like cleaning my room and I could get everything done without having to worry about it later, so. I completely subscribe to that. <laughs> excellent, excellent. I'm so glad to have you on today. Um, do you mind if we just jump in or do you do you want to get comfortable? Okay, let's no, do I, it. I'm like, you know, I've been doing this all day, so I'm ready. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, yeah, let's dive in. So I mean, I've been coaching all day, so I'm oh, okay. ready. Okay, well, this is kind of going to be like a coaching thing too, so just warning you, fair game. <laughs> um, Whatever you say. Awesome. So um, usually I like to start with stories. I like to hear kind of how people got to the place where they are, because I think that that's really where people get an opportunity to connect and really find out you know, if someone resonates with them and if, if they understand. How do I get to where I am? Uh, that's such a good question. I worked, you know, I did all the things. I went to college. I met the nice, nice Jewish boy. I had kids. I moved back to our, you know, hometown. I, I worked. I volunteered. I did all the things, right? Um, I was really pretty miserable most of the time. I went through a divorce, raised two kids on my own, and rose up the corporate ladder pretty high up and and I just my body just started to give out like it just wasn't what I was supposed to be doing but I didn't feel like I had a lot of other choices because I was like I, I gotta make money I gotta be successful in my career I have to do all the things and then I couldn't digest food and I went to a holistic healer and she's like the, you know I, I would have done anything I was ter I wasn't sleeping well I wasn't able to digest food and I'd left my company twice and returned because it's like, it was home to me. The problem mm -hmm. wasn't with the company, although I do think they benefited from having workaholics. The problem was with me. So when I decided to leave my corporate career, I, somebody introduced me to coaching and, and honestly, I, I felt like I wasn't ready to tell people I had nothing in the pipeline, you know, for type A people to be able to, to have nothingness was just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And so I, somebody told me about coaching and I was ready to take my daughter um, overseas. She had just graduated college. And I was like, well, if I sign up for this, then at least I have something to say to people when they ask me what I'm doing next. I'm being honest. I just. No, absolutely. I feel that. <laughs> yeah, you know, and then I went to my first day of my coaching program and I was like, oh my God. This is, I bawled my eyes out on the first day of coaching, my coaching program. And I was like, this is what I meant to do. And, uh, and that's what I've been doing since. So I think workaholism, and I've been thinking about this a lot, 
it's, it's, it's a word that was, it's got a lot of connotation to it. Right. So I think back in maybe the early nineties, two thousands, a workaholic woman was just a woman who was in charge. She was the one who was going to go, she was going to get things done. She was going to charge at it and she was competing with men. And so therefore that's what you had to do to compete with men. It, 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 it's, it's, it's got like a negative connotation to it, but also there's a little twinge of positive, I think, at least in our generation. And I, I wonder, you know, where I know for myself, I've had to like work on that as well, because to me, it's like, no, I have to do the things. Where did you realize that you were, you were kind of getting overwhelmed with it and that you had to, you mentioned your, your eating, um, your, your stomach problems, but how did you, how did you realize that that was the space that you needed to change? There's a lot in what you asked. So I want to, I want to try to break that down a little bit. I did wear my workaholism like a badge, like it. That meant I was worthy. Mm -hmm. so I'm working hard and people see me in the office and they see that I'm responding to emails quickly and they see that I'm jumping on problems. So I thought being a workaholic was the ultimate compliment. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to acknowledge what you said and also tell you that I didn't think it was a problem. Right. So you're right. And it wasn't so much that I was competing against men, although I do think patriarchy has something to do with it. It is that I was competing against myself in a never ending game of there's no, you will never win. Mm -hmm. I never thought about that before, but that's the truth. It's not a game you can win because there's always more. Mm -hmm. There's always more you can do. So that infinite loop is really what did me in. And I did it for 34 years. And there's a lot of joy in my corporate career. I'm still in charge in touch with a lot of my clients. I have great relationships with my colleagues. Um, so I don't regret that. I regret the pressure I put on myself to succeed at all costs. So the crossover to when was it too much? When did I know that I didn't want space for that anymore? My, I think my body was giving me all the signals and I knew it because I had left twice before. Um, I think my body, I do think timing has something to do with it. Both my kids were gonna be out of school, graduate from college. So the space was my financial um, commitments will be a little less uh, mm -hmm. more so I thought at the time. Same. I just, in true, in true transparency, <laughs> that didn't work I out the way I thought it would either, but yeah. yeah. But I mean, I was like, well, this feels like naturally a good time. And my company had sold. And so I stayed for the year to get the retention bonus and also, you know, had some stuff that I was working on there. So I think timing had a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. And also just my body breaking down. And finally, and I, I know I talk about this also is my kids were knew that I was always working. So on vacations, my family went away together every year, all 18 of us for 18 years. And I was like literally in lobbies, you know, I was on a boat once where I was like, why don't we have Wi-Fi? I'm trying to solve this problem. I have a contract. And my family never saw me not dinners. I was always distracted. And finally, one day uh, I was working at home on my last gig in corporate which I hated. And it was just not a good fit for me for anybody. And my son, I walked upstairs and he looked at me and he said, mom, this isn't normal. And it wasn't just a, this isn't normal, like a bad day. Right. It was like in deep in my soul, this has got to end. And I did, I wrote my resignation that day. Do you find that, um, it's it's a it's a a fine line I think because there's so much there's so much to be said about girl power and girls uniting and, and a lot of of, of support yeah. that you get from your sister tribe, but there's also that competition th that's in there as well. Do you find that you got that support when you were making the decision to leave and then after, or do you find that you were hesitant to share that information because of the competition? No. Um, that's a really good question. I never felt not supported, but I think my support went the other way, which was like, oh, that's just Donna. She just works all the time. So 
everybody in my life wanted to have a party when I finally get my partner <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> offered me money to leave the job. That's how bad it was. So I thought it was normal, but it was never normal. Right. Ever. Nor not at all ever. Um, I have a girl tribe that is second to none. And mm -hmm. so they have supported me. I have literally the best friends on the face of the planet. I could not function without them. And they have been through a lot with me and vice versa. So I never, they've never made me feel embarrassed about any of my decisions in my life. They've always supported me. I think that's wonderful. I, I, I also love my girl tribe, but I think it's important to kind of dive into those things because I think, you know, for a woman who's in the position where she's starting to think about this isn't working, I don't know where to fix it. I think, you know, even exploring some of those questions kind of um, offer the opportunity for that introspection. Um, so if, if say, and, and I love my job too, and I need, I think I'm corporately obligated to say that, but um, I, I think that, um, you know, as much as I love my job, there are times where the balance would be nice if I could just step out. I feel like, you know, understanding, you know, th there's, there's, almost that cliff that you jump off of when you leave. Right. And, the, you know, I remember leaving um, a role that I had a few years ago where it was so much a part of my identity. I, I would say it took me three, maybe five years to separate from that identity. And it wasn't an easy transition. So I think it's, I think it's important to kind of talk through that, some of that, because I think anyone who's making that decision again, is going to look for that support is going to want that support. And I think, you know, obviously that's where a coach comes in, but, but do you have any thoughts on that? And, and, you know, kind of overcoming the identity that you create to fit the role of the workaholic and then to change it, that's it. That's a jump. Yes. Um, huge jump, by the way. And it was my identity to be a corporate powerhouse. It really was. I was like, the more planes, trains, automobiles I was on, the more I was like, wow, look at me go. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I'm I didn't it. come to that dinner. I'm in like, I'm in London that week. Right. You know, <laughs> I'm, London. I'm just trying to make it sound better than it is. But yeah, I thought I, it was huge validation to be that busy and that powerful. Um, and in control of my work life. You know, I, I thought there was, there's, it's an addiction like anything else to be, and to just want to do, just be better and better and do a great job. So you're right that the, and I, I want to be thoughtful about this. I'm about four years out of leaving my corporate. So I can feel the layers shedding and mm -hmm. I'm also very, I, I write quite a bit. I wrote a book. I write on LinkedIn. I do some lives. I'm very raw and transparent about the transition within me. Um, because you're right. It doesn't just, oh, I'm not a workaholic today. It doesn't just leave you. <laughs> it would be lovely if it did, but it does not. <laughs> it did. And I remember I, I even wrote in a book uh, about it. Uh, I wrote a lot about being a workaholic and I did some research for it. And my son said, well, you still are. And I'm like, what do you mean I'm still a workaholic? And it was so shocking to me because I feel so different. This was fairly recent, but like in the last year. Mm -hmm. And I said, why? I don't work at night. I'm not working on weekends. Like, but that work ethic doesn't leave you. Right. And that need for validation that you're doing well in the world doesn't leave you. It's just how you deal with it. So today, instead of beating myself up so much, I may give myself a little more grace it really, for me, has been mostly a mindset shift. Which is an important, it's an important thing to notice, right? It's important to notice that it's not the physical things. It 90% of the time, it really is in your head, like anything. So how do you talk to yourself differently? Well, the thing is, when I got out of coaching school, right before COVID, I hired two coaches for myself, a business coach, like, how do I do this? Mm -hmm. And then a mindset coach and the mindset coach. I'm a, I, I'm a swearer, but I won't do that. You can her. swear if you want to, we're free here. <laughs> she poked the shit out of my belief systems. I mean, mm -hmm. I was like, I can't celebrate. I have to work. You know, I can't celebrate until 
I have like 20 clients. I can't do this. Or like, I can't enjoy the success I'm having because it could, you know, the shoe could drop. And I, I, I had this old programming that I just had to work through. Mm -hmm. So if I didn't have 10 clients, I wasn't successful. She said, you're doing really great. And I said, well, you know, and she's, what do you mean? Well, you know. And I said, well, she said, are you not celebrating where you're at because you feel like the other shoe could drop? And I said, yeah, because that's what you do in corporate. You're all, you have, you can't get too high. You can't get too low, but, you know, um, and she'd say, you're, and she would say, you're the effing shoe. <laughs> well, as long as it's a say, good shoe, right? <laughs> as long as it's a good shoe. But my point being that when she said that to me, sort of a light went off in me. And so today, like if I'm sitting at my desk and saying, wow, I don't have enough business this week. I may say, well, that's okay. It's okay. It's coming. Mm-hmm. Whereas before I've been like, oh my God, I got to work harder. What, I'm, what are the things I'm not doing? And I'm not saying that doesn't creep into me at all because I'm human, but I'm much better at saying, is this my brain playing tricks on me? Are, am I okay? Am I going to starve to death this week? Am I impacting people's lives? And if the answer is mostly yes, I move on. Mm -hmm. But I've lost weekends and I, you know, you were, you're a corporate person too, but there were a couple times in my corporate career that I lost chunks of time because I was so distraught over my job. Mm -hmm. I don't do that anymore. Do you think, and you mentioned you had both a business coach and, and a life coach. And I, I know that you're working in kind of both of those spaces now. Um, which do you think, and that's, this is not to say this is my favorite parent, but which do you think has had the most impact on your growth and your, and your change? A hundred percent mindset. Mm -hmm. coach. Not, it's not even in the same ballpark. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing is the mindset coach is it's harder for people to, to wrap their brains around that they have more control over their thoughts and their, how they show up than they do. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people think there's a lot of external stuff because that's what they've been programmed to believe. But so they don't actually believe that they have the power to change by just showing up differently. It's almost too simple for people to realize that they have more agency than they do. Mm -hmm. So the mindset piece, I think when you believe it, when you start to see it manifest, it's a thing, you know, and it can change your whole life. When the business coaching comes naturally to me, because I was in business for 34 years. So sometimes someone will come in and say to me, oh, the CEO said this to me today, and I'm thinking of doing this. And I'm like, mm, no, you're misreading the politics of that situation. Like, <laughs> that's just a knowing, a deep knowing because I was in those situations. So sometimes I switch off between the two roles, but mindset a hundred percent. Nice. Nice. And as I'm trying to think of the right way to kind of approach this one, but as, as people come to you and they're looking for advice, um, you know, a lot of it is in understanding where you want your boundaries to be. So understanding, you know, some of some people can't walk away from the corporate life or the business life, even if they're a solo entrepreneur, whatever they're doing, sometimes it's hard to, to take that leap. But it's also harder to look at the balance and understand where natural balance begins and ends. Um, versus forced balance. Like uh, I, I'm notorious for this. My children will tell you too. Like I, I have no work-life balance. Sometimes my work does well, and sometimes my kids do well, but neither do equally well at the same time because and, you know, that's, that's inhuman. Very <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. <laughs> like, but I, but I wonder, you know, in 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 helping people understand how to look at their situation to understand where they're going in their balance and 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 how to how to understand where their North is. How do you coach to that? It's a great question. And I will say that people have more control and I hate the word control. They can manage their boundaries much better than they think they can. So I do a group corporate leadership development program for high performing females. And we do an intake form in the beginning. I've done it now for three years. So I feel like I have some I, not only was I a corporate female exec, but now I coach them in groups. Mm -hmm. And there isn't a single working mom that has kids that doesn't have struggle balancing at all. And you just really said it really well. Sometimes my work does well, sometimes my kids do well, but very rarely at the same time. Right. But the person in the middle of that is you. 
So what we have is this sandwich for these working women that have the, all these like, I have to work the America Ferrera speech and Barbie was right, like, I know. <laughs> awesome. Like, I don't even want to repeat that, but like, I have to work hard. I have to pretend like I don't have children and you know, the whole I have thing. to want, but not need. And I have to need, but not want. And yeah. I mean, absolutely. that's this conversation, right? So when they come to me and they think they don't have any boundaries, I will oversimplify this. They, it's pretty easy to implement a boundary. It's much harder to honor the boundary. Mm -hmm. So when I look at, if I hear the term in corporate back to back, I literally want to shoot myself. Sorry for the you know, politically incorrect comment there. But like, do you have to go to every meeting on your calendar? Do you have to just someone sends you an invite, accept it? Right. Can you send somebody else from your team? Can we make can it you an email? <laughs> I just don't understand. Can, can you... <laughs> Put some thinking time on your calendar that's sacrosanct so that somebody else can't put a calendar invite on there because you already have time earmarked. Those are simple. They sound overly simple, but there are a lot of women that that I coach that think that they have to go to every meeting, that if they don't go to the meeting, then they're not doing their job. Someone's going to think they're slacking and all the, all the noise that you very rarely will hear a man say, and I coach a lot of men. They have their own set of challenges, just not the same set of challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen women transform in the program that I've done by just starting to do these little things like, wow, oh, I can go to the gym and like the world doesn't end. Mm -hmm. So, but there are other women. I had one woman in my program who was triple booking herself and was shortchanging herself by not coming to the program because she wasn't implementing the boundaries mm -hmm. because she didn't believe that she had the right or deserved to earmark time for herself. I mean, the thing about boundaries is they're only useful if you actually adhere to them. Right. You, know? you mentioned that men come to you with different issues, which I think is at the heart of the entire conversation because we're still women who, I mean, women in the workplace is not, it's not new, but it's not an old thing either. It's kind of, we're still, we're still breaking kind of into yeah. the place where it's, and, and I, I, I start, I, have no problem with men in the patriarchy like to me that doesn't it's just not a thing but I do understand that you know a man looks at the situation different than a woman does and I understand mostly why but what kind of things and maybe this is just to ease my own soul and my own thought process but what kind of things do men come to you with to be concerned about like what what are their corporate concerns and, and their personal growth yeah so I don't a lot of what coaching really is uncovering is fear and confidence, you know, and that will, but a man can't be, you know, women are um, almost, um, they're afraid of their emotion, but they're allowed it. And there's even a pass if a woman gets emotional, even though I think sometimes it's invalidating to say, oh, she's just being emotional. Definitely. But if you can't give that throwaway comment to a man, there, you know what I mean? That same mm -hmm. throwaway comment that we don't want, you never say, oh, that's just so-and-so. That's just Joe Smith being emotional. You don't do it as much. So I think men carry a burden that we don't see. Mm -hmm. And they and and they they have to be the breadwinner, even if, you know, if they're they they have this built-in need to be confident, to be right, to to not feel like they can be weak, to portray they're not allowed to show weakness as much as a woman is, even though we fault women when we see it. Mm -hmm. So I think they carry a pretty significant burden being corporate men. I think so too. I think so too. I think, I think, you know, one thing that I really strive towards is, is looking at it as me, the individual, instead of me, the woman sometimes, because yes. I feel like if I look at it from, if I take on the entire gender of gender issues of society today like it, it it's too much like i can only control this space and this human and and interact with other people based on what i know in this space so that aside i think you know understanding that everybody's kind of working their own hurdle um you know with women in the workplace um there's a lot of teams that are put together 
a lot of teams that uh, you've got women who are going through their their own personal journey of, of where do I belong in this space, you know, mix in a few men, mix in a few millennials, and suddenly you have a disaster, right? So how do you coach to kind of um, understanding your space within the space of a group and and really navigating his leadership to help help develop younger talent, but also to kind of, um, I guess, get the most out of all the talent that you have in a room? That's a big question. A lot of questions back in one, but there were a lot of questions. So I want to, I want to say, I, I think the role of a leader, you know, let me, let me go back to this because this is what popped up for me. I was coaching a senior leader at a healthcare company. And part of my corporate um, coaching programs is that we do what we call tri parties or we bring in whoever that person reports to. In this case, it was the CEO. And this woman is one of the best women I've ever coached. She's a, an exceptional human being and just as good as gold. And her CEO said to her, sometimes I think we look at employees like widgets, you know, put them in the right place. But really finding the right space for employees is a puzzle piece. Mm -hmm. And he was like, don't be so rigid about where you think this employee needs to go. And I was like, that's a beautiful sentiment from a CEO. And I really, so, and I think it leads right into your question of leaders need to figure out how their team works best. So, you know, putting somebody in the right role or the wrong role. And I think a lot of companies, and I, I have a talent acquisition background, they think if this person didn't work in this role, they have to leave when in fact, they just might be in the wrong role. And I think leaders really need to figure out it's an art and a science to get the right, right cocktail, the right mix for, to get the best work out of the teams. And if you're getting the best work out of the teams, they're probably highly motivated too. So it's a win-win-win which is in what we're looking for in coaching. Right. So that's the cocktail of leadership. I don't know that I address specifically the male piece, the younger piece out of that. I think you do. I think, um, you know, what I'm, really diving into is looking at the dynamics of a team, especially as a leader, looking yeah. at, you know, that that's a, a great example when everybody's doing the things and, and evolving in the way that they should. But when you're trying to coach someone who maybe isn't evolving the way that they should, um, there's a lot of, we joke about being dragon ladies sometimes because we're the older women in the office. We've had some experience. Yeah. There really is no nonsense. We probably put up with less nonsense than the men do because We've been trained to not put up with nonsense because we can't be the nonsense. So um, helping to coach and develop younger members of the team when maybe they're not fitting well, or maybe emotionally they're not, it seems like there's a, a, a gap in, in the maturity level a little bit sometimes. I don't want to, yeah. die. I don't want to well, offend I, anybody, but it seems like, 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 well, I, you know, I think there's a lot against a younger employee, first of all. They started in their careers and then COVID hit and they were not in an office for three years. You know, the benefit that we had growing up is that we were around people and we could be mentored. We could have water cooler conversations. Having said all this, anybody listening, I believe in a hybrid work model. I don't believe in mandating, you know, right. that you must be in an office to be productive. Mm -hmm. I, I believe there's, there's a balance there. So I, I just want to put that out there. But the younger generation is not as accustomed to working in an office with people. Mm -hmm. And that is a miss because slacking, Zooming, Teams does not replace face-to-face -face communication or interaction, live, live interaction. So I do think that it will bear fruit in down the road that this generation has less people skills. And I think people skills are super, super important. And I have millennials, right? I have a 30 year old and a 27 year old. My 30 year old has worked in an office, but the demands that he thought what he was expected, what was owed to him from working in a corporate environment made my head spin. Right. Like I don't like what happened today. It was a small startup, but can I go talk to the CEO? It said no one ever when I was coming up. Right. <laughs> you were lucky to have a job like, and you were going to shut up and like it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like I'm going to do the thing and keep my mouth shut and do my job and let my work. But no, that generation, like, he's like, I think I should talk to the CEO. And I'm like, honey, why don't you talk to your boss first? Like, why don't you follow the chain of command? <laughs> um, so there's some of that. Mm -hmm. And then I taught um, for three years, I ran a program called Female. 
for early career because we get these kids out of college, they're accountants, they're whatever they are. So we teach them how to do a job, but they've never had performance reviews. They've never had roommate issues. They've never had to manage their own budget. They've never had to be, they've never been on a performance improvement plan. They've never given their notice. They've never had a coworker that wasn't nice to them. We don't prepare people for working in a real world. Uh, we don't, there's not enough training for that. And, you know, we grew up and so no one taught us either, but at least we were in a place of business where they, there were some rules that we could follow. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think this generation is interesting, but I think like any other generation, they want to learn, they want to grow their careers. Mm -hmm. uh, they just don't have the necessary, always the necessary skill set and tools to do that. And I think that's on us. I think that's 100%. I don't, because I hadn't actually considered that, um, you know, when COVID hit, I worked remote, but I, to your point, I'd had 20 years experience, right? Um, and these kids that are coming out and, and, and with that gap, you know, that maybe they do need more coaching. Maybe we're failing them by not giving them um, the skill set. Are you still working the, the female program or are you? You, you know, I just, one person, <laughs> so I loved that program and I did it as a beta with my daughter and seven of her friends. And uh -huh. then I did two or three more groups. I loved it, but I just haven't resurrected it um, because I, you know, I'm one person, but it, it was probably the most rewarding thing I ever did. I think there's value to it. Um, you know, I, I can think of women in, in the office and I can think of, you know, my own daughters who are, you know, upper twenties and, and how, how much to your point, we don't teach them how to do these things. They're just expected to. And I think, you know, we kind of were thrown in and just said, do it. And so we did it. And so there wasn't a lot of, did. yeah. And we, and we, we kind of learned it as we went and, and we, we were just a different generation. Um, you know, we couldn't go complain to TikTok because TikTok didn't exist. If you complained, you were lucky if you could find your neighbor because your cell phone, there was no cell phone. Like, <laughs> like you just went and did it. It's a whole different world right now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I think we think they have all the skills and they, and they just don't, they haven't had all the experiences and, you know, yes. Have I, do I think that I taught over my children? Maybe I did. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, fair. I wanted it to be easier than it was for me, mm -hmm. but I do have two powerful children that are figuring it out and one needs more help than the other give, on any given day. Um, and I, but I think we're really quick to label the generation and probably instead of labeling them, we should help them. Yeah. No, I agree. I think there should, we should definitely step up as leaders and, and just as sage women. And, you know, this is our space and we've earned the right to be here to kind of guide them a little bit and, and help them understand their space and take back some of that, that um, I'm trying to think of the right word, but it, that it's not power, but it's some of that, that wisdom that we've earned and, and give it the credit that it is. Um, so I think we have a delicate balance because they don't want our wisdom nope. all the time, right? Ever. What they want is our, that's like, I, you know, when, when we were growing up and my parents, well, I used to walk to school in like a snowstorm, you know, that's how they, they roll their eyes when we try to give them our wisdom. Mm -hmm. We need to get into the trenches with them. We mm -hmm. need to do it with, we need to walk alongside them a little bit more than we do. There's this start that generation. Though? What? How would you start that though? How would you begin that process? Because there is that hesitation on both sides. Um, because I'll be totally honest, they're a little terrifying. They get very emotional very quickly. And and so, you know, there's one employee I can think of where even a moment's kind of guidance is taken with, oh, I don't know how to do that and I'm not gonna do that, and you need to step back. And I think there's there's hesitation from the older women that I know who are in the in the workplace to offer that because there is such a pushback on it. Yeah, it's fair, very fair point. One thing I will say with coaching, which I know, you know, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but that what I did wrong as a mom, a lot of times, because I'm a problem solver. And I think a lot of our, you know, warrior women are problem solvers, as you've already said, is my kid would come home from school and say, so-and-so I got in a fight with so-and-so today. And, and I would say, what did you do wrong? Um, you know, what was your contribution to this? I went right away to like, 
and now when I, when I heard you say what you said, but I, I, there's a defensiveness that immediately happens when you give some feedback, right? Mm -hmm. So we're missing that step of acknowledge and validating. Why is the person defensive? How do I lower the defense mechanism? So I think it's an approach and I missed acknowledge and validate all day long with my kids. Not all the time. You know, I wasn't like Cruella to Bill, but I remember saying these things. Now, why didn't I just say, oh, that must have been so hard for you to go through that with your friend? I never, I, I missed, I just missed that part. So I think with our employees, just to bring that over, when they get defensive, it's because they feel attacked, even if we're not meaning to do that or they feel admonished, whatever word you want to use. So if I had an employee like that, I would say, look, I understand this is all new to you. How do I help you learn this as opposed to you saying, I can't do it? Because mm -hmm. we all have to learn and grow. There's always things in your career that you're not going to be able to do, but one day you will be able to do them. You're going to feel so good about it. I'm not oversimplifying it here, but I do think you're miss we're missing a step. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that because they get defensive means we have to back off and I think we actually have to find another way in. Right. I think. Um, Sorry if I went out. Like no, I think you're right on point. I think, um, you know, there's a step somewhere between um, maybe the 80s and, and today where everyone started getting sued for everything. And so mm -hmm. so it became you can't do this. And, and there's this cancel culture that permeates in the workplace, too, where you can't you can't coach the way that we were coached because that is absolutely not allowed anymore. Um, you can't be hard on an employee. You can't make them cry. Not that any of my bosses did, but I still remember all of you. Oh, I have um, some. I, know, I got some stories, you know, but the, but the stories that I lived through um, and people all around me, not just me, you know, those things don't, you can't do that today. You can't even go near it. So I think that there's, there's a gap between what we learned and what's expected. And so just trying to understand that and really validate both sides of it, because there is information to be shared. I think it comes down to communication. I don't think people are communicating the way that we need to be communicating to successfully navigate this planet. Well, going back to leader and building a team, they have to learn how to communicate individually as well as collectively, right? Mm -hmm. What you and I hear may be very different than what Susie Smith is 25 you know, years old hears. Mm -hmm. So, you know, communication is, I think, listening and communication is at the heart of coaching and relationship building. You know, um, I think your employee's response is mad thing, right? Like, why are you getting so defensive? Like, we want to say, like, what is going on here? Why is she responding? Or why is he responding like that? So we get a little, like, put off, which mm -hmm. is understandable. But the reality is, unless we figure it out, the work's not going to get done the way we need it to. Mm -hmm. That's true. Right? So we, I mean, so I, I think it's incumbent upon us, as painful as it can be, because there's no quick answer. But no isn't an answer either. We So, you know, the whole idea of getting the yes is figuring out another way. Mm -hmm. I think that's so true. I'm going to work on that a lot. <laughs> I, just, there's I have somebody, to work on it too, trust me, with my I kids. Just, it, it, to me, I'm, I, I have always been um, a really... I don't want to say blunt because it's not that I'm blunt. I just, there's not a lot of fluff to what I'm saying, right? So, and again... I could be in the wrong, but, but to me, it's, 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 um, let's get to the point of what we're getting to, because you've got things to do and I've got things to do. So let's just do this really quick and let's go on to the next thing. Um, and, and I know some people, you know, um, prefer to have the backstory, prefer to have a little more understanding and awareness of all the players involved. And sometimes that's hard to give. Sometimes that's a, a difficult thing to, to bring to the table. Look, I mean, I, I heard my son when he first started working in his first job and, and he wanted the validation, he wanted the conversation. And, you know, some days in our corporate jobs, I just wanted to do a drive-by and say, hey, can you get this done? Mm -hmm. And I didn't want anybody to comment, like, just get, figure it out, get it done. So it is frustrating when you're running on minimal time. But then there was a woman that I used to work with who said, we always have time to get it right the second time. <laughs> I mean, right it's so true like, you know, but <laughs> you know like we and I worked for a web development like digital agency so like you know we messed something up and we had to redo the website 
we put every amount of resource on it the second time when the client wasn't happy, but we didn't have that same level of detail the first time. Because we made a lot of is? assumptions. Why do you think it is that, that the natural thing is to get it done and the second thing is to get it, get it done right? Because I think we rush through things naturally, you know, I yes. think. I think it comes back to balance of, too. I think we make a lot of assumptions. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Uh, I don't know. I think it's it's a little bit of both. I think, um, you know, in that urgency to get things done, urgency is a dangerous word because urgency means steps get missed. And, but at the same time, you want to keep that, urgency alive because you want to, you want to keep charging through so you can have more projects so you can be more profitable. And there's that, that, that there's that dance, right. And understanding, can I do it today or am I going to get caught tomorrow? You know, what, where can I give? And it, it comes back to this project gets some of my attention all of the time. And this project gets some of my attention all of the time, but rarely at the same time. And so that, that headspace of uh, maybe even just building out your day and blocking your day and working on one thing for a little while and working on another thing for a little while. And I don't know, I don't know the answer because I too, like I tend to throw things in the air and work on the thing that comes screaming down the fastest. Well, yeah, I mean, like I said, I worked at a digital agency. So there was a lot of data. So like, uh, even with the metrics reports, they would like head spin. So one department would send it to another department and my department then would maybe say, send it to the client. And then there would be a mistake. So there was like this, like, okay, the hot potato, like, well, I got it from that team. So it's probably fine. And, you know, and I would say to my team, you're responsible for looking at that data and making sure that you can defend the data. You can't just take it and just flip it across the transom. But in our rush to like get up all the things done, you know, to your point, urgency is not always our best friend. Mm -hmm. So I said to them, and it didn't always work just for the record, call the client and say, you just didn't have the time to review the report to the degree that you needed to, and you need more time. Now we don't always get that luxury, but, right. um, but you know, there's usually a mistake somewhere if mm -hmm. you don't spend the time. I mean, I, I think we can make an assumption that most of the things we send out without proper oversight have a mistake in it. Sure. I, feel confident I think about that's that. probably accurate. I'm not going to own it if anybody asks me on the street, but I think that's accurate. I, mean, um, I don't know. I mean, I'm using some of my experiences from my corporate world and it's a lot easier to say oh just review it and then you're like I have 20 other things to review how am I going to spend the time on this right but that goes back to the balance I think and yeah. and and looking at the woman or man I mean at this point it's it's gender neutral whatever but um in in looking at the person who is constant like I know people who walk in the door at you know half hour before work starts leave two hours after work constantly throughout the day make sure that everybody knows that they're constantly busy so that everybody knows to stop giving them projects. But that seems unnatural and unbalanced too. Um, and, and that's to let, let's look at the details of things. Let's go through the details. Is that time management or is that an obsessive control need to be on top of everything? And so in the dirt with everything and, and deep in the weeds. I don't, I think everybody has their own answer there. Only every, only, you know, where the line is, right? What's normal mm -hmm. for you may not, might be abnormal for somebody else. So I don't, I don't think there's one size fits all. For me, I knew I had crossed the line because it was taking a physical toll on my body because my kids were like, enough is enough. And they had said that to me, you know, for years and years. I mean, when my son was like eight or nine, I switched jobs to go to a local media buying company because it was a drive away, no flights, no nothing. And he, and I think he said to me, he was sitting, I remember where we were sitting, we were sitting on our stairs and he said, you don't spend enough time being my mom. And I was like, oh, I, I guarantee you he doesn't remember saying that to me. But I literally was like, I don't think there's anything, I, I mean, I, I don't even feel like he was manipulating me. I mean, he was too young to be manipulative. Mm -hmm. It was horrible. So I think if you look around you, you'll there are enough signals about whether or not you've crossed the line for once, which is like I think about accountants during tax season, like from now till April, they don't have a life. Right. But they kind of know that going in. Is it is it specific or is it spilled over? Mm -hmm. And I think only you can answer that. That puts it on me, and that's another task. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get to that one. I'll think about that one. But when you're when you're 
in your position and you realize that your body's starting to decompose because you've got too much stress, you're not managing it well, you're not managing your balance well. How long did it take you to kind of realign and start understanding that you had made the right decision? And was it an intuitive decision? Because I think intuition is such a big part of all of this. Um, was it an intuitive decision after when you kind of pulled yourself out? Did you realize that your butt, like that was what was wrong with you or did knew, it take a while? Yeah. Okay. So it was intuition. Oh yeah. It was definitely intuition. And I, I most, I think women largely, I was trained in intuition by a, a medium during COVID. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that I was so tapped in, but I knew that I had this sixth sense. And I think a lot of women do more, a little more than men mm -hmm. overall. I was in sales and client, client customer service. And I'd walk into them and I'd be like, that person hates us. This person loves us. I could feel the energy of the room and knew right. what was going on, you mm -hmm. know, without words. So I knew that I had a huge level of intuition. I just was ignoring it, you know, as it related to my job, because I was like, oh, I like the paycheck. I like some aspects of the job. It will get better. Um, I can, I have the power to change this if I do X, Y, and Z. And I failed miserably at all of those, but I was scared too. Like, it's hard to give up a big salary mm -hmm. and, you know, change your lifestyle for however long it will take until you can get back to the, a similar place. So fear was running my show. Um, and I didn't believe in myself enough, you know, and I didn't believe I could do it. And then I did it anyway. So I think intuition had a huge part in it. Huge. When you when you say that um, you were working with a medium to kind of dive deeper, I'm bad. No, it's not. So here's the thing is, and I don't know if it's because I'm a Gemini or what the deal is, but I'm very logical. I'm very data driven. I like to to. I'm digital marketing, so I'm in the numbers oh, all I knew the time. I loved you. Yeah, I love you too. Um, but there's that part of me. But the other part of me is very much in the woo and very much understanding the intuition that that's within us. I think we need to, uh, on a on a massive scale, start listening to that. And really, that's where I think the communication comes from and all these things. But I'm fascinated by the fact that did you seek her out or did she seek you out? How, no, did, that, so how did that relationship happen? Because that's something that's very interesting to me too. And I think we need to yeah, do that. And so I also want to, if I could do one thing in this world, and I'm going to get to your question. The idea that we, we can't talk about woo in corporate makes my blood freaking boil because mm -hmm. there isn't a single CEO alive that doesn't ask, what's your gut? What do you mm -hmm. think gut is? It's freaking intuition. Right. It's your male gut. It's your, I don't even know, but yes, your intuition it's is a your knowing gut. without facts. Right. Intuition is I know, like I know, like I know without the data. I know. I shouldn't get on this plane and you, and you act on it anyway. So mm -hmm. I'm really, really like, I think we need to eliminate the woo piece because it's, it's really like denigrates mm -hmm. who we are as humans. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just wanted to say that I am part. on this train and I will back you hundred percent. I agree 100% with that because to me, it's, it's like, okay, I want you to shut off this part of your personality and pretend like it's not there so that we can do these things. And the two are so interrelated for me, like down to what kind of content needs to be created today, because that's what needs to go on. Because I feel that not necessarily because the data shows it, but because with the data and that intuition, I can surmass that kind of direction. Yeah. One more point about that. Um, I took a neuroscience for business class through MIT, which I'm sure MIT had nothing to do with it, but they just probably slapped it. So right. I don't, I don't want to impress anybody. I think it's fancy. Um, and I, and uh, the people that we call analytical, the final decisions that we make go through the limbic brain, and that's where emotion is processed. There isn't a single decision that doesn't have an emotional component to it. I love that. You have just validated so much of my life. Continue. <laughs> That's amazing. And I'm sure I screwed that up a little bit, but the yeah. reality is there's no such thing as a straight analytical decision because we all have some level of bias or intuition or emotion attached to a decision. Right. At the end of the day, we're animals. So that's that's a part of like just to survive every day. Yeah. So I, when I saw through. that, so I was like, oh, that was worth the $2,800 for the course. Yeah. <laughs> Because I don't remember a thing, thing else. Um, so the whole, so what happened during COVID is I'm locked into my house and there's nothing really to do. And now I'm a coach and I'm doing, I'm seeing clients on Zoom. And then 
my kids and I um, had seen this medium who lived close by and I was must have been on her mailing list. And the email was, do you want to tap into your intuition? more. And I was like, well, who doesn't want to do that? And as a coach, that seems like, yeah, sign me up. And so for a year, I took uh, a, um, weekly classes with her on tapping into your intuition. And uh, it really helped. It really helps me become an even more powerful coach. I don't lead with it because to your point about the woo, I don't know how some of my clients are going to feel about it in advance, mm -hmm. but I use part of my practice for sure. And their, their whole idea of coaching with intuitive listening, what's not being said, it really helps me coach because you can say I'm fine, which of course, fine is never fine. Right. And I know deep in my soul that there's way more going on. So it allows me to ask different questions. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's a very powerful part of how I coach. I think that's great. I think more people need to do that. Um, Mostly because, I mean, even even in the business space, when I listen to what's being said, I hear I hear different things, if that makes sense. But I hear I hear what it's meant to be like. I hear what you're trying to get across, even if you're not saying it. And it's it's almost one of my it's a downfall I, I in some ways in that I'll finish your sentence for you. It's not because I'm trying to interrupt you. I'm just trying to help you. And I it took me a while to realize I wasn't really interrupting you I you have the word but I have the word I have the physical word um but it's it's interesting and has it taken you down any other paths have you started investigating other um intuitive properties I guess have you there's so much in the space of of understanding that we don't understand yet so I'm curious yeah it has taken me down lots of different places I have lots more places to go mm -hmm. So I, I don't think we're ever done, but I breathing, you know, when I first started working out with my yoga instructor, uh, she would say, okay, breathe. And I was like, yeah, I got, I got that down. I can breathe like nobody's business. You know, she's like, you're breathing from here, from your mm -hmm. chest up. I want you to breathe from your belly up. And I was like, well, I don't even know how to do that. So I wasn't even breathing right. So today I breathe with my whole body. And, you know, I will coach a lot of corporate people. I've done a, a, a tremendous amount of workshops and I'll, I get these, you know, health people, people who are really healthy. And they're like, yeah, I, I practice breathing, you know, box breathing mm -hmm. before I go to work and after I get home. And I'm like, but you're more stressed during the day. You actually need to do that during the day. Because you're calm down your parasympathetic nervous system, right? You know, like if you, you actually pause before you make a rash decision, you will have different choices and you can make many more decisions. But when you're like in the moment, so yes, yeah, so intuition has guided me. It's changed me because I, I don't often react as emotionally. I am an emotional person. I feel things deeply and I'm not changing that anytime soon, but I am going to take more time before I respond. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, I think that's, and, you know, it's, it's yeah, a hard so. thing to do. Um, and I'm working on that as well. I uh, Are you familiar with human design? Yes. A couple of my coach friends are certified in it. I am not. Okay. So one of the things that I got into, uh, I actually learned about it last year um, on another podcast. Um, a wonderful person. If anybody wants to go back, it's Natasha Glinsky taught me all about it. But um, I went in and read about it and it, 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 it goes through kind of how you should respond and what you need to do to respond better. And one of the things is, is waiting to respond, which I don't naturally not do. Intuitive, right? <laughs> yeah, like usually I'm, I'm right in there just throwing out whatever quirk I can. And, and so one of the things that I've really been working on this year is pausing, listening and hearing the afterthought, right. And then accumulating a full developed thought and then trying to speak, which has been, it's been a challenge because it, again, it's not natural, but, but waiting to respond, I think has, has helped me more than 90% of the education I have, because it does, it does open the door and the space to oh, allow. Awesome. Right. Right. And so I think, um, that's interesting that you said that because that is that is one of the things that I am actively working on today. Yeah, so I think people think that intuition is 
you know things, you, of course, the definition of intuition is knowing without data, right? Like you just know, but then how does that manifest in a work environment or in a life environment? And just that pause, while it may not be classic intuition, right? It is giving your, your system time to respond in a less emotional manner. So if you get a nasty email in corporate, your natural tendency is to fire back, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. it doesn't, no one ever wins when you're escalating. Mm -hmm. You actually have to learn to de-escalate. So I had a client that called me in a panic and said, the CEO just asked me about this huge bonus that I have to pay um, this employee this on this comp plan. And do you think he thinks that I don't know how to do my job? Do you think I'm in trouble? And I'm like, okay, what else might be going on here? New CEO, new private equity firm, huge outlay of cash that you're that you're sending out. Do you think it's just possible that he just needs to the details so that he can just tell the private equity firm what's going on, that it actually has nothing to do with you? That he just needs the data. Mm -hmm. And she was like, Mm -hmm. Yeah, respond that way. Don't, because what happens with a lot of people and anybody listening, listen to these words carefully. Not everything is about us. So when we get a question where our first inclination is, did I do something wrong? Am I in trouble? You know, how do I respond? Like, I want to get defensive. I want to defend myself. Just like if you take a step back and you say, what's the basic answer here? What's the answer we're trying to get to? Then mm -hmm. you'll answer much more. I hate to use the word professional, meaning in a bad way, but you just you take some strip some of the emotion well, out of it. Thoughtful, maybe not professional, but thoughtful. More thoughtful. Um, I think does that make sense? sense? It does entirely. Um, you know, when I was younger, I struggled a lot with putting myself too much into the story. I think my ego was too in, uh, involved and mm -hmm. I'd, I'd combat with, with leadership because my ego was a hundred percent of what was going on. Um, and it has taken me a while to, to try and remove myself. Um, and I, I share this only for those people who may kind of hear the twinge and may not yet be there ready to admit that it's them, but, but I've, it, I've taken a big turn, I would say maybe in the last 10 years where I do pull myself, I try to pull myself out of the story and read and, and understand the space better. But I think that comes with maturity too. And I don't know that it was necessarily because I, I turned this massive corner. I think maybe I just got a little bit wiser. Maybe it was having older children. Maybe it was, you know, understanding and navigating other people's workspace, but, but to remove your ego is not an easy thing to do. And I think that as we make decisions in, in business, especially as we're making choices and deciding where to go and what path is best next, especially if we're looking at, you know, leaving a corporation and, and going towards solopreneurialship, going towards, you know, anything else, um, you have to almost remove you from the story so that you can decide for someone else if it makes sense. Does that I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Taking how yourself I, out of the story. No, no, no. It's good. Um, you know, the thing about coaching most of the time is we are coaching around interpretations, the stories we tell ourselves, right? So right. taking ourselves out of the story or Q-tip, which is what I learned in my coaching program is quit taking it personally. Yeah. Keep that. That's, like <laughs> That's, That's just like easy. And it's, it's right there. <laughs> um, it's true though. And so like, that's exactly what happened when this woman called me about the CEO. Just respond. This was the employee. This is why we paid him this. This is when he's getting paid out. That's it. Mm -hmm. Don't have to defend yourself. The other day, a 25-year-old, 27-year-old, the mom called me. I, the daughter grew up with my daughter's friend. She got an offer. This is a big one for whatever she got the offer for. But she wanted more money. So she wanted to give this whole song and dance about why she wanted more money. I said, well, what was the range for the position? There was more room. I said, an offer is a negotiation, but mm -hmm. women have this head. Like, I don't think men have this as much. They might. If I ask for more, they're going to think I'm this. Then they're not going to like me when I come on board. No, no, no. You don't get it if you don't ask. Number one, mm -hmm. offers are negotiations. I said, do this. Say, I was, I'm thrilled for this position. I, you know, whatever. I'm excited to join the team. 
for this next step in my career, I was aiming for X. Don't give the whole reason, you know, my rent, my this, my that. Just say I, you wanted you wanted the higher range, and they gave it a higher range in five seconds. What this actually has come up a few times. Um, as recently as last weekend, I was talking with a girlfriend about uh, money and the blocks that women have, but. I remember being in business school, and this is another one of my embarrassing stories that I'm going to share because I hope it connects with someone, but I was in business school. We were doing the negotiation class. Let's learn how to negotiate. You're buying a car. And I literally broke down in tears. The stress of negotiating for whatever reason, and it, it, it if I'm negotiating for someone else, piece of cake. If I'm negotiating for myself, there seems to be some sort of and I've gotten better, but there seems to be some sort of disconnect. Um, and it, I'm sure it, it we could tie it down to worthiness and, you know, my upbringing or my thoughts as a child. But but what how do you coach women, especially with negotiation, because it is so tied to value. It is so personal to detach enough to negotiate well. Strip out. I work with my female clients to strip out the emotion. It's not about being liked. It's not about being worthy. You've already made it through the process. They've already made you the offer. If we're going to go, let's just stay with the offer for this minute. And mm -hmm. then we can, but you've already made it through. They took all their time to vet you. You've made it through 18 rounds of interviews. You've done two homework assignments because, you know, interview process, I can go on a whole nother tear, which I will not do today. And you won't invite me back. Um, <laughs> You're always welcome back. Is, <laughs> you've already been vetted. You think they want to give you up for another ten thousand dollars? They have hang on their face. That means they didn't do their job. Mm -hmm. So, um, how I work with women, and I have a lot of clients going through negotiation stage, is ask for what you're worth. What's the and worst thing? Is that the market value? Like, I mean, again, you well, know, there's a range for the position. So let's sure. assume, yes. Yeah. Sure. So even, you know, even when I go in and, and have my annual reviews and we discuss my salary or whatever the case is, mm -hmm. here is the range for the market. Here is where our, my experience fits into the market. And, and every single time, you know, it comes back to, well, you can make that up in bonuses. Sure, but there's still room for negotiation. And, and that's not to say that, you know, I'm still a terrible, terrible negotiator, but, but understanding where your value is in a place, um, you know, is it worth getting third parties involved as far as, um, you know, as a woman who's trying to, to work their way through the corporate ladder or, or any role to sit down with someone outside of both the workplace and her house to understand what that number is? Yeah. I think my next door neighbor is so funny. I just moved and my next door neighbor is a coach and the husband is an executive comp guy. So he spends his entire job right now is to help women negotiate for what they're worth. He's, I'm going to get his he's, number. <laughs> you should have him on a show. He's amazing. You know, he was a head of HR at some places and he's an attorney. So he has all like the comp, but that is a hundred percent of his job is to negotiate, help women negotiate. They, we leave hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table. I mm -hmm. mean, mostly he's working with over 500K, mm -hmm. but the point of the, it's the same principle. Women don't want to ask what they're worth because they don't want to, they, it reflects badly on them. So if you have a guy that telling you, let's go back to your situation for a minute and you get the bonuses and you want the higher base, the bonuses aren't guaranteed, a base is guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So the way I would go back to your bosses, I, I'm a top performer. I've been here for a number of years. I'm happy about the bonuses, but there's some part of a bonus that I cannot control, depending, you know, if it's tied to company performance. And I would like X. I'll tell you what, you give your notice, they're going to find that money faster than you can say your name to try to keep you. And that happens at a lot of companies is you don't get what you're worth until you decide you want to leave. And then they right. counter off you. It happens right. a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Mm -hmm. Or you have to leave your company because you've come in at some level and you've you know, they, it's hard to make up that Delta. So you actually have to leave. Mm -hmm. But my basic philosophy is ask for what you want. What's the worst that can happen? You don't have to be a not nice person about it to say, right. you know, what? I've been here long enough. The bonuses are great. I still believe that I deserve X and I would like to ask for it. Respectfully, I would like to ask for that money. Mm -hmm. What are they going to say? The worst they can say is no. Right. But advocating or for yourself is part of your own growth. 
you know, and I think that goes back to the conversation about when do you know when it's time to leave? And I think um, True. in a lot of cases, that's when you realize where, where you are in your, in your journey is, is when you, you ask for that and, and the answer is no. And I'm not saying this is my situation, but I have to throw this disclaimer in in case my boss listens, but um, I understand that, that, um, that moment when you realize that you've hit your, your pinnacle at an organization and it's not going to change. And then you have to make that decision. Okay. Does it matter enough? And I think it always should um, for me to go and explore the other options or do I stay here or do I go it alone and see what I can do on my own? Because I think that the, that's kind of in, in this space, especially in this age group of our peers, there's, there's that, um, we're still kind of shaking off women in the workplace, right? So there's a little bit of, are we getting paid enough and equally and are we, could we do better and can we do better by exploring the options out there? I think there's so much, your questions are always like, there's so many layers to them. So thank you oh, for sorry. being, so, you. <laughs> God, you are in the right business. I think by and large, women don't ask for what they're worth. I'm just going to put a blanket statement out there. And so I had a client the other day, I'm sorry, I'm bringing up clients, but they're, no, I think that's great. That's she's we're working. Here. So she was a former client. She went through one of my group programs and I always check in with my clients because I feel like we're connected. So mm -hmm. whatever. So she needed to talk. She's working for a company now where they haven't paid the team in months. They're out of cash. And she said, I don't, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, I can't tell you what to do. Um, you know, that's on you. But I will say, if you need to make money, you have to decide that you need to make money. Mm -hmm. So we just played with some scenarios. I said, give them what, if you really believe in the company and you want to stay because you think they're going to get funded, I think it's reasonable in that situation, which is obviously a very extreme situation to say, I'm going to work less because I have to find a way to make more. They're not paying you anyway. So you're giving right. them the same amount of hours with no pay for months? Um, no. Um, that's a hard no for me. It's, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, are you independently wealthy? Good for you. Do you want to, you know, then you're a charity. But um, so we we talked about some scenarios and the next day she texted me and she said, that was a really good conversation. I need to put some boundaries up because I can't continue to work like this. And I need to decide to your point, whether to go on my own or to look for another job. But if somebody's not paying you for months, I mean, come, I mean, you're a professional woman, you're mm -hmm. a working person, you deserve to get paid. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was an outlier. That just happened this past week, that conversation. Yeah, it's about timing. That's interesting. I think, I think it spills over too. I mean, we could, we could have the same conversation about relationships, right. And, and women understanding their space in a relationship and are they getting what they want out of the relationship? Because it does boundaries. I mean, I, to me, it's like, okay, it's geography. Okay. The relationship that you have with your coworkers and your, your um, leadership versus, you know, the relationships that you have in your home or with your friends, they're all relationships. They're all in how you communicate. They're all in how you, how you value yourself and what you bring to the table. And are you getting a fair and equal balance back in it's, it's that energy balance, right? Like, is that energy getting shared equally, or is it, is it something, you know, where I'm giving you 90 and you're giving me 10? Um, I think it doesn't matter where that is, but that I think women in general struggle with it because we're, we're trained and in inherently givers. We're, we're, we're to fix the things we're to care for the things. And so we take that, that breath back in order to, um, you know, you let everything, said, every else, everything else you shines. Landline for me. Well, <laughs> you, I don't, I don't know if you read my book, but I was in a 22 year relationship mm -hmm. and I ended it because of a boundary that I just couldn't, I just didn't keep until I did. Can we dive into that a little bit? Because I think yeah, that's important. Can, but you brought it up. So I was like, no, 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 no. I, I actually have not read your book yet. Yeah. I'm going well, to. Don't, but, you don't have to now, but, but I'm just okay. saying it. I, have, yeah. I wrote a whole chapter, but I mean, I was with the most loving, wonderful, upbeat, couldn't have loved me anymore. Like every fiber of his being loved me. And I loved him. Mm -hmm with reservation I never you know because he wasn't I was a 
top performer, mm -hmm. top performer, high earner. It took a lot to learn me and he had a better balance. You know, he didn't want to work to live. He had much better balance. So in the beginning, I was like, oh, yeah, I could learn something from him. And it was great. Mm -hmm. And then five years became 10 years and then 10 years became 15. And then at 15, he's like, yeah, I want to do my own thing. And then for 10 years, no income, lots of dreams, no money, no money, no money, no money, no money. And then pretty much almost insolvent. And I'm, you know, my dad passed away and I was like, can I go into my future? Was the only thing I wanted him to do was to get a paying job. I didn't care if it was like driving for Uber. I just was like, balance your dream with some reality, like paying a bill. Mm -hmm. I didn't pay his bills, I did, you know, living expenses. So we kept our finances separate, but he couldn't do it. And I was like, I just felt like I had to, I had to, I had to end it because I was like, this isn't good enough for me. And I deserve more than that. So I, after 22 years, it's, it's down 60. hard. <laughs> it's super hard, yeah. but I think, um, but it took me a long time. Right. Because, it, but it comes down to, it's not necessarily, um, about love at all. It's about, no, I love him. It's not the even energy him. balance of, I am giving so much that I'm deteriorating and you are not, and you may be fine with this relationship because your needs are met, but if mine aren't as well, and I'm paraphrasing for you, mine aren't as well, then I am going to kill myself trying to overcompensate for what you weren't doing. Well, look, I mean, after my dad died, I was like, wow, things are really not good. I I hired two therapists, like literally boot camp therapists, two on two. And I spent thousands of dollars because I was like, I am not going to go. I'm going to go out of this relationship kicking and screaming and thinking I did everything possible because we love each other. Mm -hmm. And, but the reality is the value, the energy imbalance was huge. Mm -hmm. And there's so much rationalization, like I should just be happy that someone loves me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it just proved like, I just, I just wasn't, first of all, I became a coach because I want to live my values. And I felt almost hypocritical because it was like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I can't do it. Um, it was one of the hardest decisions I ever made. I think it's really brave though. I think it's it's incredibly brave and rare when you can look at the face of <sighs> rejection's not the right word, but of separation. Separation is such a, a crazy, like it it's so entwined because as as beings, right? We we try to connect. Like connection is everything. So to literally separate yourself and understand and recognize that you're doing it for something deeper within yourself. That's hugely brave. Um, yeah. and, and not championed as much as it should be, but, but it's definitely brave and it should, I mean, that's, that's how we grow and learn as humans, right? That's how we experience. It's been very it. painful. You know, the one thing yeah. I say about the work I do is people think change is, la, 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 la. you know, like, oh, you know, I'm going to go to yoga more. I'm going to feel better about myself. Change at a cellular level is freaking hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, I my, my body physically hurt when we ended our relationship because I was so connected to him. I still am, but I couldn't be with him because my val our values were so misaligned and I couldn't do that to myself. I had to honor myself, but it hurt mm -hmm. like a lot. It mm -hmm. took me a long time. And it, you know, I'm not completely over it, but I would say I'm clearly on the other side. So change is, when we say change is hard, physically hard it's emotionally hard but it doesn't mean it's not worth it what have you done to help yourself get um through that i've had energy work done which you know i believe in you know mm -hmm. i've been certified in reiki um i moved out of the location that i was in i started over two hours away i'm in a healing place in the berkshire geography which... this actually came up in another conversation i had geography is the energy of a space and a place is real so when yes. you have to remove yourself or change your space to a place that speaks better to your energy at that time i think there's value to that in understanding that 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 sometimes a place has memory and sometimes a place has a different energy than what you need at that time 
Yeah, I mean, they talk about the vortexes in like S Sedona. You know, mm -hmm. I'm in the Berkshires, which is similar to a Sedona in that it's a very healing place. It's got Propalo, if you know yoga, people know Propalo. It has Canyon Ranch, it has Mirabal. I mean, it's literally like this, a healing place. And so I did move two hours away. I left my life. I mean, I still go back and forth. Um, and I, I want, this is a tough one, but I felt my feelings. Mm -hmm. You know, so women are notoriously bad at pushing things and men too. I just have to deal with it. I just have to soldier through, but I let those feelings be and they were painful and it hurt a lot. Um, but I let myself feel them as opposed to just saying I'm fine because I wasn't fine. Um, and you know, I, I never grew up in an, an environment where it was okay to feel my feelings. Right. And so that was, and I didn't want to feel them. Honestly, I did not want to feel that way. I still don't like and them. I but went it... to every therapist. <laughs> I was balanced. I did everything I could, but you can't actually bypass your feelings. They're going to find a way out. And I am living proof that there was the only thing you can do is just feel them and let them move through your body. And you know, eventually it's going to, it's going to get better. Time's the only thing that really helps, mm -hmm. I think. I mean, and my dad died during that time too. So it was just like, I was just triple whammied. That sounds like so difficult. And then my brother almost died. I mean, literally in the space of 24 months, I had that. And I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. I'm I'm glad that you made it through one. Oh, I'm so on the other side. But it's, it, it is one of those things that I don't think I actually really felt my feelings until maybe like five years ago, I was going through some things and, and a girlfriend called and was talking me through it. And, and it was such a terrible time. And, um, right. I'm really good at holding in and, and brave facing. And she was like, no, stop. She was like, just do you just feel it, feel all of it. And I was out for probably a week just in tears and crying and, and working through it. But I think, I think if we can impart anything on our daughters, it's to go ahead and to, to feel that energy because there's the balance, right? And, and if you're that low, you can feel that high. You just have to feel that low holy so that you, you can do. feel the high low lift. And my kids had never seen me like that. I mean, honestly, between my dad dying, which was the precursor to this, my dad dying allowed me to end my relationship. Like they're definitely connected. Mm -hmm. um, I don't I don't really know what to say, but I feel like that we are in a society where we're we're not we don't think and so we don't think it's okay to be vulnerable and open, no matter how much work Brene Brown does. When we're in the moment, we think I have to soldier on. I, I love that you have that friend, but my kids have not ever seen me like that before. Mm -hmm. And so that was a new paradigm. And I, you know, I still struggle with, did they see too much? Should I have held back more? But I couldn't, I just, I couldn't do it. I think there's an yeah. honesty in that, it, well, especially with children, um, because I've brave faced for my children for a lot of years. And I think that in, in representing the truth of my emotion, it allows them the freedom to also feel their feelings. And it, it, it's, it's, it may be yeah. terrifying and disruptive at first, but in the end, they see the recovery too, right? So they see, they see both sides of it and they understand that that feeling isn't forever. That feeling is, is that moment or that time period. Such a good point. Such a good point. Yeah. And we're on the other, we're on the other side of that, but, um, I don't share this because I want anybody to feel bad for me. I like to share it because mm -hmm. we're, we can get through anything. We, if Glennon says we can do hard things, I just didn't think I was going to have to do hard things all at once. Right. Right. <laughs> so well, I might as well just pile on. But it was a really um, eye-opening time. And then I wrote the book during while this was all going on. So there's a lot of emotion in my book. Um, and Sounds very writer, therapeutic. Will you tell us all about the book, though? Because I, I, I want to ask you about that and learn more about it and send people. I really book. feel like I talked about it a lot. I mean, <laughs> I was in a writing program. I write regularly. Mm -hmm. My business coach had me start writing biweekly emails about three and a half years ago. And a friend of mine who I had not met, but you meet so many people online, um, signed up for a writing program. And I signed up for the program through Georgetown. 
um, and I just wrote a book, you know, and I took a lot of my emails and I made them into stories. But when I wrote my bio, the book was going to be called Silly, which is one of my program successes, uh, say it like it is, which is my brand. I don't think that's going to be foreign to anybody as listen to me. Mm -hmm. And then I made the program successes living in intention. Um, but when I was writing my book bio, I wrote Donna Starr was unsuccessfully successful for 30 plus years in corporate. I was like, wait a second. I think that's the title of the book. Mm -hmm. Because I looked successful. I had all the things. But I really wasn't successful because my body was just a, a free. I was insomniac. I just looked terrible. Um, and uh, I wasn't successful. So I had to redefine that. Um, I just wanted to redefine what success meant to me. And it wasn't that anymore. And it wasn't being in a relationship just because it felt like, you know, I should be in a relationship. Right. You know, I've, I felt like I sold my, so uh, I just wanted to strip myself a little bare, which is what I did in the book. After you wrote it, or maybe even during that process, were, what did you, what were the immediate feelings that you were feeling? Was there relief in putting it out and letting it go? Or was it was still kind of I think was, apprehensive? Yeah. You know, when you're in writing it, you don't realize that someone's actually going to read it. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> <laughs> So I felt a very vulnerable because it, I shared, I shared a lot, mm -hmm. which is normally I'm a pretty private person, but I was like, well, if I'm going to do the work and I want you to do the work, I want you to see that I've done the work and what I've learned, because I don't want you to make the same mistakes that I did because mm -hmm. no one has to live their life on autopilot just because that's what they think they're supposed to do. And I want, I want better for you. That's such a gift. That's such a gift. So when people come find you, what do your typical clients look like? And you know, it's such a range, but I would say my sweet spot is corporate professionals from mid to senior level. Mm -hmm. And I don't distinguish between men and women. Men do really well in one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, and they need coaching, you know, because they, they need a safe space. I, I really don't like coaching terms, but they need a space where they can be real and they can cry if they need to. And I've had many a male cry on a coaching session, which I consider success because any yeah. sort of release is good. But I think I do very well with corporate people because I've lived that life mm -hmm. and I'm on the other side. And to your point, I don't suppose that you have to leave your corporate job to have a happy life. I think you just need to figure out what that means to you and what you're willing to, what, what choices you're willing to make to have a life that you want. Right. I it agree. is a choice. What you want is different than maybe what I want. Right. I think in figuring it out, though, sometimes it does help to have another voice, another another person inside your head to kind of guide you through that. Um, I absolutely agree. I mean, you know, when you think that Tiger Woods has a coach or, you know, some of the top, the top performers in the world have coaches. You know, there are coaches like Rich Lipman, you know, these mega super coaches. They're coaching CEOs that make millions of dollars a year. Everybody can use a coach mm -hmm. or a mentor or a therapist like right you know we're on this earth once be the best version of you however that happens you don't you know you don't get a second chance well it's nice too when you have a mentor because then you can take the kind of the load that you're carrying share it reevaluate it take a lighter load and then distribute right so it's it's almost again it goes back to that energy transfer. i love how you just said like... that you should write that down that was awesome <laughs> it's recorded we'll throw it out there <laughs> thank you that was pretty awesome um but i think i think you know anytime you get that kind of um that back and forth, like the, the energy transfer back and forth, it, 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 it's just nice. It's nice to kind of realign, to connect, to get a flow, to reevaluate, you know, where the blockages are and, and go forward. Um, I agree. How do people find you? Coaching wasn't a thing when I was in corporate, really. No, we didn't have coaches back in the day. <laughs> like, you know, like, I feel like my life would have been so much better. I mean, and, you know, one of my mentors in coaching was a psychologist. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, people didn't want to put a doctor's appointment on their calendar. So he changed it to a coach so that CEOs wouldn't be embarrassed about, you know, what, because at that point you could see everybody's, you know, they had assistants that can see their calendars. Right. But he's probably 70. I don't know exactly how old That's he That's probably is, brilliant. He probably started the whole movement and doesn't even get credit yeah, for there it. There are three guys that 
started the movement. I think that he, I think he is definitely very responsible for the movement of coaching. I don't know that he, he would say that, but he was early on in coaching. So he's like my mentor. And um, so people find me through referrals. I'm very active on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm becoming more active on other social media channels, but because my space is mostly corporate mm -hmm. um, and I bring in the woo and I, I make no bones about I that. I like the woo. I do. I just feel like if the more woo we can bring in, the better off we're all going to be. You know, when, when corporate started to bring in the woo with Brene, not that mm -hmm. Brene's woo, and no. then they had meditation, um, that's not really the core of it, right? The mm -hmm. core of woo is a, a deep level of spirituality that's part of all of us that we bring into the corporate culture you know, that we are more than just the sum total of ourselves, we're the sum total of each other. And I just think that that's not well-defined in corporate what we actually would do. Mm -hmm. I think that's beautiful. We've it got to find a better way to position that so that we can, we can put that in there because I mean, the sales pitch is inherent in a marketer, right? But, but I think in, in finding the right verbiage, to get adoption. I think that's what we need to do. I agree. So you and I can work on that. And yeah, we'll, definitely. We'll, we'll <laughs> I'm in, that. I'm in. I mean, you are awesome. I mean, you are like the best. At what oh, you I do. love you. This is I love you. like a delight to talk to you today. This has been an amazing conversation and I hope to have more of these in the future because I think, I think you bring a lot of experience and a lot of, a lot of, um, not just intuitive knowledge, but it just, it, you bring a lot of heart to the conversation that I really appreciate. And I imagine that you're, you're, if, uh, coach subjects, what, what do we call them? Your clients. Um, I, I imagine that they also probably get a lot from it as well, because it's nice to have a, a safe place and, and, and to grow in that safe place is, is important too. And, and that one-to-one -one is really huge. So we will put, it is. it's honestly the biggest honor of my life to facilitate growth in somebody else. One of these days we're going to get into all your stories too, because I'm sure you've got amazing stories that, um, you've collected by unnamed clients over the years so we'll yes, have to get yes, that's <laughs> we'll to get this drink together. or two so yeah, thank you definitely. for having me i really loved every minute of it Wendy. oh no thank you i appreciate you and we'll put all of your information in the show notes so everybody knows how to find you but definitely we'll do this again 